So with that, uh, I think our one of our la- almost our last piece of business for the day is to take a look at uh, an issue that was raised uh, by uh, Joyce Judy, uh, the president of CCV, with me a few days ago, and that is. Um, this refugees and asylum seekers and their how when and how they can access uh ccv tuition tuition from our state colleges etc and so um we'll get some more background on this from uh tom little from vsac but for now let's just uh shift over to elizabeth st james to uh have a look at some language that we, uh, we ask that you uh draft Sure, good afternoon. Uh, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, would you like me to share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. So in response to um, committee discussion yesterday, I drafted some language to get us to get you started. Um, and the uh, section in Title 16 that uh, discusses determination of residency for tuition purposes uh, for the Vermont State Colleges, which includes the Community College of Vermont, is uh, section 2185. It's a very short section. Uh, You can see here uh, A and B were all that were there. Um, And uh, the Board of Trustees shall adopt policies related to residency for tuition purposes consistent with state and federal requirements. So most of the residency requirements are in um, uh, Board of Trustee rules. There has already been a carve out for um, active duty um, service members who come to Vermont who are transferred here for non-educational purposes. Um, and they can be considered a resident for in-state tuition purposes um, when they get here. And so what I've done to start with is the same thing for, um, and we're gonna, I think we're using the term refugee and I'm gonna come back to why I said using the term in a second. So I've added subsection C um, and based on committee discussion yesterday, it sounds like it sounded like the committee wanted to focus on the Community College of Vermont. So I've, I've to CCV, so I've limited it here saying for determination of residency for tuition purposes for the Community College of Vermont. But I will note this statute is applicable to all of Vermont State Colleges. Um, so it could be limited or it could just be left um, broad and open. Ms. St. James, uh, I just want to mm-hmm. stop you there for a moment, if, you, if I may. So are these things that the boards themselves could do? In other words, with uh, the military uh, carve out, was that a board decision or was that a legislative decision? Um, I mean, it's in law, it's in state law. So the, the car, I'll go back to the sharing my screen. Senator Terenzini. Yeah, I'm looking on our website, Senator Campion, and, and uh, I don't see this document unless I'm missing it. Is it something that uh, is up there or? I uh, don't know if uh, Beth has shared it with Daphne yet. I you did. Have. Okay, then I'll ask Daphne. Uh, Daphne, if you haven't had a chance to put it up, um, she uh, try refreshing. I just I see a message from Daphne to try to refresh your page. I'll I'll try that. Thank you. Okay. And if you need me to send it again, Daphne, please let me know. Um, so uh, it's a. Great question. So, I mean, we can see that state, this is current state law. So the legislature added this carve out for active duty military members. Um, whether it was the college that came forward and said, we need this. Um, I, don't, I don't know the legislative history on this, but it is state law. And it appears in, I did look at the CCV um, uh, Board of Trustee uh, the rules on this, and I don't know that I'm the person to speak to that. I think it would probably be better to hear from them directly. Um, but they they do feature um, there is more of a carve out on their in their rules for um, uh, 
uh, not just active duty military members, there's also a carve out for um, uh, veterans. And I'm again, not familiar with the history behind that, whether that's a separate section of, of state law that allows them to do that or whether that's um, something that they uh, feel as though is cons already consistent with state and federal requirements and therefore included in their rulemaking authority. I think they would probably be the best to speak to what they feel is within their authority. Okay. Um, so uh, what I've done is, is again, to start with mirrored uh, the language for the exception for active duty military members. Mm -hmm. And so it says a person who resides in Vermont and meets the definition of refugee. Um, and there is, um, to my knowledge, no state definition of refugee. This is a federal definition. It's a federal term. And it's found in uh, Title VIII of the United States Code in Section uh, 1101A42. Yep. And it's a, it's a long definition. I'm happy to share it if you want it. Um, upon arrival in Vermont and for the period of residency in Vermont, be considered a resident for in-state tuition purposes at the start of the next semester or academic period. I will say that... Um, I, uh, the attorney in our in, uh, Office of Legislative Counsel who handles matters related to refugees uh, is uh, Becky Wasserman. And I checked with her just to make sure that I had the right refugee definition. We chatted a little bit about the fact that when we're talking about asylum seekers or refugees, those terms can be thrown around in the public sphere um, and not necessarily mean the same thing um, when we get down to definition. So um, for example, um, I heard the committee um, when we started talking about um, uh, this bill or you know, this concept applying um, mainly to the Afghan refugees who are, who are coming in and being resettled in Vermont. And that's kind of what spurred this discussion. Um, there's a possibility that they, uh, those folks that you're talking about are not actually refugees under this definition. They're here on a humanitarian parole program, which means they don't fit under this definition. And it just gets, there are other definitions relating to non-US citizens who are here for various different reasons, um, including asylum seekers. Um, so depending on who the committee means to sweep into this category could really change the definitions we need to refer to um, and how, uh, who falls into those definitions and if that is the committee's intent. Okay. Uh, why don't you, <clears throat> there we go. So right now, refugees that are coming in from Afghanistan are referred to, would you repeat that? Or referred to as? Um, so, and, and this is just a tiny bit of research. Um, yeah, I am not an authority on this. But um, my understanding is they're coming to us under a humanitarian parole or probation um, program and uh, may not qualify under the, this federal definition of refugee. I would be happy to do more research on it or perhaps um, Becky, I don't want to volunteer her, but as um, the attorney who works um, in this area of the law, she may be able to speak far more eloquently to it than I am. But I do think it's worth noting from the get-go that um, because we in, in, as lay people are referring to um, a community with one term doesn't mean it meets the federal definition or the state definition. In this case, it would be federal. So um, uh, it would be important to really think about who are the people uh, you're trying to capture here and so that we can if this is something that needs to be done in state law, uh, make sure that we get those definitions right. It's a great point. It's a really great point. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, and, I, and I think as we, we're going to hopefully hear from Joyce Judy tomorrow, and I'll ask Daphne to reach out to the state colleges and UVM to understand both the process that they would recommend, as you mentioned, uh, how to do this work, and then who they in their minds also are trying to capture uh, with this. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Uh, this question is for you, I guess, Senator Campion. So just 
just for my own understanding, you're proposing um, that, for example, the Afghan refugees relocating here, they wouldn't have to wait the one year period to be considered in state or out of state for, for different tuition pricing purposes, correct? Yeah, that's the, basically the conversation I had with Joyce Judy, as I recall it. Um, and I do think I would also add that as we talk about this, we, I think it's also good for us all to just revisit this conversation in general. So the answer is yes. But for example, why are we letting any, why are we making anybody wait? You know, to be honest, I mean, yeah, that's just my only follow up to that is, you know, it's kind of, hey, if you're moving here, uh, I don't want you going, at least in my community, over to Hudson Valley, you know, right. for something. I want you right here. Go to CCV. I don't want, you know, so I think it raises that question as well. That was, if, if I could follow up, that was exactly yeah, my point. That was exactly my point right now is we're, as we know, we have a, a population problem, a, a workforce problem yeah. and everything else. Why? If I move here from New Hampshire with my family, for example, why yeah. wouldn't I just on day one be able to take advantage of the better rates uh, rather than going to a school in New York or New Hampshire or wherever else? Yeah. Let's just do it for everyone. Yeah. Now, yeah. So uh, as usual, you and I are on the same page. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no, I think it's a good point. And, and there are some, and this is what we can pull apart with CCV is I know that there already are some agreements with bordering towns. So for example, in my area, you know, there's, I, I don't know if it's miles or, or specific towns that can already benefit from a tuition reduction to CCV um, that might persuade them, you know, to head east rather than west, which, you know, is the biggest competitor, uh, Hudson Valley Community College. So, um, so yeah, I think we put that on the table as, as well. Why not? open this up to everybody. Uh, other, uh, Senator Lyons. No, I was just gonna agree. Um, okay. uh, and we'll probably hear, we got pushback on that, but um, I remember a uh, year, hundred years ago when I moved it back into Vermont Yeah. and I could get a job first teaching college before I could go to get, uh, start my PhD, so. <laughs> fascinating discrimination hmm. yeah yeah no it's interesting it's, um yeah senator Pershley. one thing that we heard in, in committee a couple of years ago when we were talking about uh early college i think it was or dual enrollment in in those students that wanted to go out of state we kind of got into this issue of residency a little bit and i remember there was a concern about uh, students that had a parent in Vermont declaring residency, and maybe maybe we don't care about that if somebody's living in a border state but going to school here with in-state tuition and claiming residency because they have a relative that has a home here. So I don't know how how residency is defined, if there's a definition of that, or if that's just in the in the rules that the school has to develop. Uh, but it's something we might want to look into. Yeah, that'd be great, uh, Ms. St. James, if you would look into that a little bit for us. And we'll ask people. Okay. Uh, Mr. Little, thanks for being with us. Uh, and thanks for um, listening to the conversation. Uh, before you introduce yourself, I'll just mention and, and give us your comments. You know, it's we started this conversation a little bit after a conversation with Joyce Judy around um, making this kind of change for refugees and uh, asylum seekers. You just heard the comments from uh, Elizabeth St. James. And now our idea of, you know, is this, is it time to, to open this door uh, a bit more? Um, I, I suspect with some students, uh, you know, financial aid, if you're paying that out of state tuition, if you've lived here nine months, and, up, and applying for financial aid, you're getting into a tuition reduction program that may or may not uh, bring you down to the in-state tuition, all those kinds of things. So uh, with that, I'll just pass it over to you for the next 10 minutes and get your thoughts. Certainly. Uh, Tom Little, uh, General Counsel at Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. Good afternoon. Uh, and I, I think 
convey the apologies of both Marilyn Cargill and Scott Giles, who are otherwise booked this afternoon. Uh, uh, interestingly, oh, as, as the general counsel at VSAC, there have been times over the last 17 or 18 years when I have been asked by VSAC to look at, uh, I guess, what, what we call residency appeals. And these are uh, students generally who have been determined by VSAC to not be eligible for the various VSAC grant programs uh, that are restricted to Vermont resident students. And there is an uh, internal to VSAC appeal process. One of the uh, rules is that you can't move to Vermont for the purpose of going to college here and establish residency at the same time. Uh, and there aren't very many appeals, uh, generally speaking. I think that rule is pretty well understood, but at times there are special cases or you know, weird variations. The VSAC uh, rule and the application or interpretation of it has always uh, pretty much aligned with that of the University of Vermont and the state colleges. I have a little more experience with that of the university than I do with the state colleges. But uh, when you think about the tuition differential between in-state in and out-of-state tuition, um, those institutions have been very careful about residency because the business models for them um, depend to a significant extent on charging more money to non-resident students. And if they uh, spied a, a slippery slope coming at them that would make it um, harder for them to maintain that distinction, they would be concerned about the, the economics of it. Um, and as I, as I indicated, the, the VSAC statutes make it clear that the VSAC grant programs are for these uh, Vermont resident students and you can't move here in August and uh, start going to UVM or the state colleges in September and expect to get in-state tuition. If I may, I just uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just, I'm just thinking to myself, and I'll just uh, say it aloud. I, I, I might be able to see where UVM's coming from with their admissions numbers, but with the state colleges, uh, this could be the out of the box kind of thinking that they might need a, you know, it might help them. I mean, to be uh, known as, geez, move to Vermont. And are you know immediately get in-state tuition? I do, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. The, the uh, that's a good point, and I, I I am not familiar with you know I, I throw out throw the toss the word business model around a bit loosely there. Uh, the I ran we ran it VSAC ran into something like this uh, years ago with the Somali refugee population that had uh, uh, come into the greater Burlington area, Burlington, Winooski, South Burlington, um, and we're looking at least some of them. And I think we need to keep in mind that if we have three or four hundred Afghanistan refugees, they're not all going to be applying to go to the state colleges at the same time. They're presumably a limited number of them, but uh, we ran into some of, of the same problem. And this was a, uh, there was a, 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 a two or three groups of Chittenden County nonprofits and faith organizations that were trying to help the Somali refugees with getting jobs and getting education, getting driver's licenses, just about everything, housing. And, and we weren't able to help them because of the statutory issue about residency. Um, we did, I did find um, through someone at VSAC a uh, uh, 
there's an associate, a national association of student financial aid administrators. There's a national association, as you know, for everything. Um, and I can send this to you. I, I, I just came across it. It's a tip sheet for financial aid administrators working with refugee and asylum students. The term that, that this uh, one page document uses is, is actually asylee students. And this is focused on the, the free federal application for student financial assistance, the FAFSA application that is for federal financial aid. And there uh, is a, again, it's a one page summary tip sheet, so it doesn't go into a deep dive, but it does give some guidance about which non-citizen statuses are eligible for federal financial aid. That includes US permanent residents with a permanent resident card, conditional permanent residents, and then there's a regulatory reference for that. Other eligible non-citizens with an arrival-departure record, which I guess is referred to as an I-94, from the Department of Homeland Security showing any one of the following designations. Refugee, asylum granted, indefinite parole, humanitarian parole, parole or Cuban Haitian entrant. It also covers uh, citizens of the Republic of Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands or the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, which suggests to me, and, and, and this, this National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators is a very reliable uh, professional uh, group, and they, they, they don't put stuff out that isn't uh, something you can generally rely on. It suggests to me that, that the federal financial aid eligibility may go beyond that statu federal statutory definition that... Um, Beth St. James mentioned to the committee in um, uh, Title VIII of the United, United States Code. Um, more, more research would need to be done by that, but it suggests that perhaps the uh, Department of Homeland Security or perhaps the US Department of Education has, has uh, adopted rules or regulations that go beyond that statutory definition of refugee. We can, we can look into that uh, as well. Uh, so we haven't, uh, VSEC hasn't had but about, but about a half a day to think about this, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I can go into more detail about the VSEC statutes, how those are structured, uh, if you would like. But uh, the only other um, thing I can mention that may be a, a, a slight analogy is that um, there is a there's a Vermont National Guard program that is a, a refundable or, or, or forgivable uh, interest free loan that functions as a scholarship if you are uh, join the guard and complete all of your guard commitments uh, for basic training and years of service, you can get um, a, 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 a very significant benefit towards tuition. Um, that is not restricted to Vermont resident members of the Vermont Guard. Mm. And that was in particular because the Guard recruits and has members of the Vermont Guard who live in New York New Hampshire and, and probably a few other states. So I don't, that's not directly on point, but it's might be good for the committee to know. That is helpful. I think it makes sense now to, to, to pause to get questions. Uh, and Elizabeth St. James, I think you've, there are a number of things that would be great for you to bring back to us uh, as uh, outlined by Mr. Little and others. And we'll also hear from CCV hopefully tomorrow.
but for now, do I see any questions uh, for either Mr. Little or Ms. St. James? Senator Hooker. Uh, one of the things I'd like to know from uh, Joyce Judy is the number or the percentage of non-residents that go to CCV. Yeah. You know, what are we looking at as far as um, what is that? What does that look like presently? It's a great question. Yeah. Anything else right now uh, for either Ms. St. James or Mr. Little? 